Well, on today's episode of Kilts and Culture with USA Kilts, we're going Irish with Redbreast 12 Year Whiskey. Howdy, boys and girls. Welcome to Kilts and Culture. I am Rocky. This is Eric. Yo ho. Today's show, special treat with St. Patrick's Day coming up in a couple weeks. We wanted to do an Irish whiskey. So, in honor of St. Patrick's Day, we are going to try Red Breast 12 year old whiskey. So, I've heard very good things. It is a lot more expensive than I thought it was going to be. So, <laughs> it's very good. You get what you pay for, right? I'm hoping. That's not always the case, but I'm hoping. Sure, sure. So, Mr. Mac, why don't you tell us a little bit about Red Breast Irish whiskey? Well, Red Breast is a red robin um, that only sings continuously throughout the dark Irish winter. Oh, you want to know about the actual whiskey? Oh. That's that's four seconds of my life. I can't get back. <laughs> you had me going for a second there. I thought it was like <laughs> yeah. reading like something that inspired them or something. I know. I thought so too. No, nah, that's just where the name bottle. came from. But uh, so it is a intriguing nose of dried fruit, spice, and the all tasty toasted wood. Mm, delicious toasted wood. You know, when I'm when I'm hungry, I just, you know, the, the desserts that I like to have after dinner, you know, a little, little cordial, maybe a little, uh, maybe a little uh, creme brulee, or toasted wood. Mm -hmm. It's it's really a toss-up. Mm. 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 Toast, Delicious. Toasted wood. Mahogany. Mahogany wood. <clears throat> really? Mm. Mm. Wow. Okay. Indeed. All right. So, toasted wood and fruits and nuts or something. It definitely has a tamer nose to it than a lot of the scotches we try. I'd say what fruity. Mac, what are you getting on the nose? I, I'd say a little bit more on the fruity side with a little bit of spice. Yeah. I'm definitely getting a wood, but it's like a... It's like a light wood. It's like a balsa. I don't know. It's like a light wood. It's, <laughs> it's, it's like it's mellow. It's not giving me like heartburny kind of feel. It's just it's, it's very like, cool and light. I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. I don't know. I, I think my nose is off today. I'm having trouble here. Um, it's definitely sweet. Um. There's a little bit of an iodine presence to it. That's the woodiness, you know, woodiness. It's actually got, you know, there's a little bit of that kind of a tank thing going on. Peppery is how I describe it. It's peppery. Yeah. There's some sweetness, but but, but there, I would, I would call it peppery. I would say, like, here, here's a here's a weird avant-garde kind of thing. It's kind of rough in the mouth. It's, I don't know. You almost, do it, does that make sense to either of you? Yeah. It's it's it's, it's like sandpaper, like it's kind of sandpapery. It's <clears> I, <throat> I have a little bit of a texture on my tongue after it. Um, dry almost. Yeah, uh -oh. yeah. On on the box it says a balance of fruit, spice, and a sherry follow. Okay. Okay. With a lingering it's finish. It's always anyone, leading the witness, but I kind of get that. If anyone the out there in, in YouTube, Facebook land, Twitch land, um, have tried Red Breast, or if you're drinking it right now, I know at least one or two people have actually bought a bottle just to drink with us on the show. So, right. Um If you want to put stuff in the comments, what you guys are tasting, what you guys think about it, um, let us know. Tell us in the comments. Um, yeah, it's overall, it's not bad. Um, it's it's better than Jameson's. Um James Sons, excuse me. Um, yeah, any other thoughts on on it uh, on on the, the 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 whiskey before we score it, Mac and uh, Eric? I 
I'm trying to pick up on that uh, dry mouth thing you were talking about. Um, I think I, I think I see what you mean. Um, it's short. I'm like, I drink it, you know, keep it in my mouth for a second. I suck air through it, swallow, and I like rub the tongue on the top of my mouth, and it, it feels a little rough. It's it's not my mouth, but like the the surface of my tongue feels rough. I, I'm talking out my ass a little bit, but it's like this is how it, I'm, I'm trying to articulate what I'm smelling and tasting and feeling. How many breath mints have you had today? I don't know. None. Um, no, it's I don't mind it. I mean, I, I, that's that's getting into voting territory, but I'll just say um, the pepperiness is the is the the thing I'm getting the most. Um, I am getting a little bit of a fruit. Apricotty kind of a kind of a thing. I, I can see that. Um, yeah, I I'd agree with you. I agree with you on the pepper. That's if I'd say it's reasonably balanced. If there's one thing that's a little off keel to me, it's the pepperiness of it. Um, it's it, it tastes it tastes cold to me. Not the temperature of the thing. I don't know. It's it's just a little. It's not as warm as scotches. My my mouth and my 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 gut don't get as mm. warm with drinking this. Um, but I do get the okay. pepperiness that you're okay. talking about. Okay. Mac, any other thoughts? No, I think you hit it. It's not as, it's not that like kick you. It's very, a punch in the mouth and that's it. Yeah. It's reasonably smooth though. As, as far as mm -hmm. the, yeah. the, the Irish whiskeys I've tried, this ranks up there. It's probably, I've probably had like five or six. Um, this probably is first place. I'd still kick the pepperiness down a bit, but not bad. All right, Mr. Mac, score it one to ten. What do you get? I'm gonna go uh, six point eight. Okay, okay, pretty strong score, pretty strong, Mr. Eric. I was gonna go uh, yeah, probably like a five point eight. Like not as not as much as Mac likes, but but you like it. I would buy it. I'd I'm gonna go six point three. And I'm I'm gonna say this about it. To me, red breast <laughs> red breast is the pork chop of whiskey. Where I don't mind it. If somebody puts it in front of me, I will drink it, but I will never go out of my way to pay for it when I'm out. Like, I would never go into a restaurant and go, you know, you know what I'm in the mood for tonight? Pork chops. Like, if I see steak and pork chops side by side on the menu, I'm going steak every time. Um, but I do enjoy a well-done pork chop. Not not like well-done, like dry, but like a well-made well, well -made pork chop. So that's where I'm going with it. It's the pork chop. So, indeed. Okay. Not bad. Pork chop, pork chop express. <laughs> the pork chop of whiskey. Now, as usual, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let it breathe because I found that uh, the flavor definitely changes after it's had a chance to relax. In, I don't know fact, if we I don't know if we opened the bottle ahead of time this time like you're supposed to. Yes, we let it breathe for about we we poured them out about yeah. 25 minutes or 30 minutes before the actual show started. Yeah, so it did have a chance to breathe and kind of you know gas off. Something. Something tells me it still needs a little more somehow, but, and there's a note in the nose. I'm just not quite getting, but it reminds me of something, but I can't place it right now. But, okay. But it's nice. Definitely the nicest Irish I've ever had. Yeah. Agreed. All right, boys and girls, you know, the drill, put the comments, uh, put your questions in the comment section, um, here, there, where, wherever the comments go, we will answer your questions, whatever you got. We got you. Um, we'll start off with one of the preloaded questions. Um, that way, that way, while uh, uh, Max starts to get all the list of people coming in. Cool. All right. Is Max saying they're going, uh, uh, sort, sort, type, sort, copy, paste. <laughs> Where's my word document? <laughs> Jim Edwards asked us, or said, I should say, uh, I know where you guys work. So, taking that into account, can you please comment on kilts and accessories made overseas in places such as Pakistan? I know the upside, of course, is the of these is the low cost, but sometimes the downside seems to be the quality. What are your thoughts? We'll, we'll start this with a disclaimer. 
Um, we do not speak negatively of competitors. That has been a rule of USA Kilts from day one. We instill that in every single employee. Right. Here's a little peek behind the curtain, as it were. I get emails probably two to three times a week um, from companies in Pakistan trying to sell us, you know, have us carry their goods. You know, hey, we got the best prices on kilts. We have this, we have that, whatever. Um, and the prices are, are <laughs> very attractive, shall we say. Um, and there are certain things that they do well and certain things that they do less well. So, let's let's start with utility kilts. Now, because we don't make utility kilts, so I feel safe, you know, uh, putting this out there. Um, as far as a utility kilt made in Pakistan, they're not bad. They're not that expensive compared to a US made one, but quality-wise, material-wise, they're not bad. There are things that I've seen on them that I would do differently. The finish on them, meaning like the, the overlocking, the surging effectively of the seams on the inside and that kind of stuff, um, could definitely be you know upped a little bit, but that takes time, which takes money. But all in all, for the price, price of a, a Pakistani made utility kill, under a hundred bucks kind of price range, it's not a bad value. I'll put it that way. Now, when it comes to the uh, uh, the tartan kilts under 100 bucks, they basically fall into two categories. Um, they fall into acrylic or a wool blend, wool acrylic blend, that kind of thing. Um, sometimes they call it a polyviscose material and that's potentially a whole other animal, but it falls in the same kind of price point. Um, the Generally, I would say this, Here, here's the peak. When I get offers to buy kilts made in Pakistan, a, uh, an acrylic kilt or the, the low end kilts, tartan kilts, start at 15 bucks to 20 bucks landed, pretty damn cheap. If I was doing those, including the cost of shipping, including the cost of customs, then double it for retail, you're looking at like 70, 80 bucks. So, but knowing that, knowing the cost of the kilt itself is between 15 and 20 and i'm saying 15 to 20 because some offers are 15 50 some offers are 18 dollars some offers are 20 dollars so they're they come in at different prices but what are you getting for 20 bucks compared to what you get from material woven in the uk compared to us labor compared to all the fit and finish compared to the the buckles and the straps even if half the price of the kilt is material, that's $10 for two yards, two and a half yards of cloth, that's not a lot of money. Um, in the same thing with labor. If it's, you know, 10 bucks for the labor in a kilt, and, and this, isn't, this isn't even accounting for profit margins of the company in Pakistan. Um, it, the, the, the costs are so much lower that it's it's very concerning for me from an aspect of what are you getting for the money, the quality for the money, and the the amount of time it takes to make the thing. How much attention to detail are they just going as fast as they can to you know pump out the next widget to move on to the next one, or are they you know taking time to match up the set exactly, you know match up the stripes exactly where they should be, you know measuring the front apron precisely so that it matches on the right and the left side. All these little tiny things. So it's one of those where it's I'm kind of rambling a bit, but it's one of those where what do we think of them? It, I think they're fine for what they are, but what they are is inexpensive. So if my, if my best friend came to me and said, look, and I didn't know the kilt company, and I, they said, look, I know you wear kilts, and I want to buy a kilt, I got 100 bucks to spend, what am I going to get? I'll explain to them, look, you can get a kilt for under 100 bucks, but your expectations should be here, not here. You're going to get pre-made sizes. You're going to get acrylic fabric. You're, you know, it's, it's, gonna, it's not going to be the same color as the mills in the UK. It's not going to be the same. It'd be more vibrant, putting them mildly in some cases. Um, so there, there's a lot of differences. And this isn't necessarily a bad thing. It just is what it is. If you don't have a lot of money and that's your only option to get started, fine, do it. But you shouldn't expect to be 
have your expectations up here. You're not getting a Lamborghini, you're getting a, you know, a used car, period. So it's one of those where, or an entry level car, you're not used because it's gonna be still brand new, but you get the point. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm rambling a little bit, Eric. Yeah, I don't have a lot to add, except uh, it, it really does come down to your intention with the kilts. Um, yes, if you need an entry, if you need a point of entry, um, and if you're unsure if you're going to get into this on a regular basis, so you don't want to spend a lot of money because it may be a once and done thing. Like you wear it for that one weekend and then you can't decide if you like it after all. It's exper an experiment, then they can be very useful. Um, but you have to be realistic about how long they're going to last. Um, I think the, um, the, the materials in some ways are very scientific, like they're using very, you know, modern materials like uh, uh, interweaving uh, it glues and, and they're using uh, the acrylic blend fabrics, which are very theoretically washable. Um, but yeah, it, you know, it, it's, uh, I, I think that you may enjoy it when you get it out of the box and you wear it for a few times, but it's gonna, the, the, the satisfaction curve is probably gonna go down pretty fast because um, the pleats will not stay in as well. The leather, leather, from what I've seen, tends to be fairly thin. It's got that kind of cardboardy feel to it, so it, it tends to get rough pretty fast. Um, yeah, it's just it is it is what it is. Like you said, it's a cheap kilt. Um, it's great as a putting your toe into the pool, um, but you gotta be realistic about how long it's going to last and how it's going to look, how good it's going to look, the longer you have it. It may look okay for a season at the Ren Fair. You know, but it's not necessarily going to look great a year from now, two years from now, etc. As it starts to settle. Um, <laughs> you know. um, so it's, uh, yeah, I think in that sense, I'm grateful because it is definitely a thing that has helped a lot of younger people, especially get into it. You know, it's like you got limited funds. You know, if you can go and get a kill for 50 bucks and you, know, you get, a, get to scratch the itch, then fine. Um, but um, be realistic. Basically. Yeah, I I'd add this as well, um, the, starting there and rolling downhill a little bit. Um, if this is your first kilt and you're not sure, touching on what Eric said, yes, I agree. It's not necessarily a bad thing to get a cheap kilt if you have no idea if you're ever going to wear this again. Um, where I would go with it after that is I wouldn't necessarily get a second one. At that point, if you get a first one and you find out that you like wearing kilts, then I would try to move up the scale a little bit. I would try to look, move up the scale to the next nicer level or check out the different fabrics that are available out there, see the different options, and save up to get something that is going to last longer and that you're gonna like a little bit more. It, if it's something custom, that's even better because it's fit to your exact body shape. So starting there is fine, but starting there, you don't end up there necessarily would be my words of advice. It would be start there. If, you, if that's all you can afford, fine. And then move your way up as you find that you like it and you want to do it more. So you're, you're not investing money in something where it's just going to be a waste if you never want to wear it again. But at the same time, if you want to wear it for a longer period of time, you want to get something that's going to last longer, period. Yeah. I think um, it's it one. I will say this: it is important to realize that we're not talking about a monolith. It's not like every single kilt from overseas is coming out of the same factory. There aren't a lot of factories, but it's not all one operation. You may find there's variances in quality based on where it's coming from. Um, I have a uh, made overseas kilt I got from Stillwater. It was like the first uh, you know wool kilt I ever bought, in fact, and it's okay. It's all right. The leather, the leather is really rough now. Um, the fabric itself is okay. It's it's very rough, very scratch. It is wool. It's not no. It's not a wool acrylic, but it, it is 100% wool. But it's very scratchy, uh, kind of rough. Not a great weave, but you know, I still use it occasionally. If if you relegate it to casual wear, rough and tumble stuff, like you know, I mean, the classic favorite example is like if you're changing the oil on your car. That's what you like to always say, Rocky. Um, uh, then it's fine. You know, I mean, and that was the, that was one of the first uh, traditional type kilts that got allowed me to get my feet wet, you know, and getting used to wearing that style of kilt as opposed to utility kilts, which is what I had worn before. So they have they definitely have their place. 
And uh, as with any Kilt product, do a little homework and do a little poking around the communities. Some people will may say, well, I got one that was made over here from this company and it was meh. I got another one from this company that was made overseas and it's okay. Um, the quality is going to vary. So. Yep. I'll, I'll say this, um, since you brought it up, shout out to Jerry at, at a uh, uh, yeah. Stillwater Kilts. Jerry, the guy that owns Stillwater Kilts, is a very nice guy. Um, the only real bugaboo that I have with companies that sell Pakistani kilts is where they try to pass them off as something that they're not, or they just kind yeah. of like hide the fact where they're made, or they downplay all that kind of angle to it. Jerry is very upfront about what he sells, where it comes from, what it is, what it's not. Um, and he's a nice guy. Um, he's just an honest broker, period. So it's not that we have an issue with Pakistani kilts, it's we have an issue with disreputable vendors more than anything. Yeah, and that, that is a, one of the factors of that is there's been a, there's a, been a convergence between people who are selling very cheap products and uh, the people who are sourcing things for the sake of selling them to tourists in Scotland. Um, like the, the infamous, you know, Royal Mile kilts. Um, the uh, so just because something ships to you from Scotland, it doesn't necessarily mean it was made there. You need to be careful about that. Um, as much as possible, do your homework on the company if you can. Agreed. Yeah. Before we get to the next question with Mr. Mac, Eric. Yeah. Random thing. Mm -hmm. I just right right at the end there. I took a sip as or I was breathing through my nose as I took a sip. I got a hint of Play-Doh. <laughs> no, no. <clears throat> that would be yeah. wheat. If you say Play-Doh, I would say that's a wheat flour kind of a... Smell it! I, I let, once it's breathed in my glass a little bit for a couple of minutes, it's got the, the nose, I picked it up earlier and I interrupted you very rudely and I apologize, but it was, uh, it was like, wow, that got sweet all of a sudden and now I'm getting much more of a, um, kind of a little bit of a pear or apple kind of a scent to it and, um, getting some of that classic caramel note that I, that my nose seems to be very sensitive to. Um... The no, fruitiness is definitely coming coming out in the nose more now. I can't get Play-Doh out of my head now. Mac, are you getting Play-Doh at all? Do you still have any of yours? Okay, so if you just open the container of Play-Doh, I get a little bit of that. Yes, Play-Doh. <laughs> Do you like Play-Doh? That's good. You'll love red breast. <laughs> Takes you back to your childhood. The time yeah. of Bread breast. For those kids who love to eat play doh and paste. <laughs> no, oh, I'm too serious. It tastes like play doh. It smells like play doh now. I, I know. Now that you've said it, yeah, it's starting to infect my brain too. <laughs> I'm gonna say I'm gonna say it's the it's the rye or something. It's because you know play doh is made from flour, so right or it used to be. I guess now it's synthetic, but. It's kind of the sweet and sweet and peppery, salty kind of taste of. Or, yeah, I don't know. Play Doh. That's it. I've ruined it. Are you going to change your score? No. I, okay. I, I like the smell of Play Doh. It does bring you back. <laughs> like playing with Liam with little Play Doh stuff. You know, that's fun. Now, I will say this. <laughs> Here's a question. Question for you two. Question for the audience. When you played with Play Doh, either as a child um, or as a parent. Did your parents allow you or did you allow your child Drink. to mix the colors of Play-Doh or did all of them have to stay separate so they stayed in the same containers at all times? Oh, no, we mixed them. Of course Mac? we mixed them. No, they should stay separate. <laughs> How can you avoid it? I, I'm with you. Really? No, no. no. It, it'll, it'll ruin it. My OCD will not stand. <laughs> nah. We would try. We would try to reserve some pure colors, but you know, I mean, as soon as you have them stuck to parts stuck to each other, they're going to intermingle. You know, you're yep. going to have corrupted yep. play doh no matter what. Yep. So. You take the thing apart that you made. You you cut it out carefully and put it back with the other colors. Nope, Lee, it's chaos. No, <laughs> no. Liam tries to mix them. Oh God, yeah. I can't with Liam anymore. No. Yep, chaos. Sorry for you guys. Debauchery. No, <laughs> not at all. You're gonna be Mr. playing with him. You're gonna be playing with him tonight. You're gonna be like starting to shape a whiskey glass. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna be like that guy from Close Encounters of the Third Kind, just like. Yes, you know. with the uh, 
Indeed. Okay. How about All right, question? What do, we got? what do we got rolling in? Alrighty, so we have Anthony uh, asking, um, I'm guessing he means tartan here. Is there a certain material or is it about the pattern? Like, would you be able to use cotton, silk, or polyester? For what? For, I'm, assuming, make, I'm make assuming the, the tartan. For a kilt? For just the material he's literally looking at. What do you so mean? he's asking, Okay, is the tartan, it has have to be a certain material. Can it be made in right. cotton, silk, polyester? Oh, to to be called a tartan. Yes. Got it. Got it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's that's an easy one. Um, I thought yeah. he was asking this for a silk kilt. I was about to get all weird with that one. No, it does not have to be wool to be tartan. You can have acrylic fabric that is tartan. You can have poly viscose. You can have cotton. You can have silk. As a matter of fact, there is a. I do have an image in our archive of a 19th century. Um, I think it's a children's tartan suit, uh, which is made from silk. So it is a kilt and jacket and everything, and it's all silk. So yeah, the material uh, is uh, relatively insignificant in, in from a technical standpoint. From a traditional standpoint and from an authenticity standpoint, um, your surest bet of making sure you're having really good tartan would be to buy Scottish wool, I suppose you could say. And you get the full effect of the tartan that way because you're also getting the interplay of the threads and the texture of the wool. You're getting how the light plays on it. You could say it's actually more satisfying to look at tartan that's been woven in wool as opposed to other, as opposed to like printed on, on, on polyacrylic. Like there are some companies now where you can get like your, your clan tartan on your pajamas or on a throw pillow or both, you know, and, and they're just basically, they're doing a digital print of tartan onto, you know, a synthetic fabric. Um, and it's what you'd expect it to be, you know, it's fun, but it's not, doesn't feel real or traditional. It's just like a nice, fun way of showing off your tartan. But the tartan is the graphic. It's not the material. Yep. Tartan is defined as a, a pattern of intermingled warp and weft. It does not have to be wool to be real tartan. It can be whatever fabric it's made in. Yeah. To varying degrees of authenticity, I'll say it that way, where some are a little bit more... Um, Tartan-esque, where they take a little bit of liberty with the, the warp and the weft being a touch different, or they might bastardize it a little bit, like there's a ton of black watch, where the single railroad or tram lines run this way and the double tram lines run this way. Are you, are you saying that when they're weaving it in silk, they will, they'll change things slightly because otherwise it's going to look odd? If I had to guess, it's more to do with um, the, the centering of the design on the bolt of cloth, depending on how wide it is, or it's what the client wants or what the designer who's putting it into the system, you know, wants to see in it. I don't think it's anything um, like a hard boundary of you must have this and mu this many colors this way and this many colors this way. It's more just, you know, at their, at their whims, as it were. Okay. Um, they're not necessarily at the, they don't need to be authentic to sell it. But it's, I don't think there's any technical reason why they have to have a warp and a weft different so okay indeed but hmm. silk kilt no <laughs> not in the same age no it would, that would be that would be weird uh it would it's it would blow off or it'd be weird yeah i wouldn't do it i had uh two related questions here so i'm gonna kind of throw them at us because i think i have some information on this um let me know when you're done pouring I'll wait. I'm, I'm, I'm testing out the Play-Doh thing now more fully. It's an excuse to drink as well, but yep. I'm testing out the Play-Doh thing. Just let me now, know when you're ready. Fresh out of the, fresh out of the bottle. I don't get the Play-Doh. It has to sit. Has to sit. I'm Quit save that with your food, Rocky. All save, right. save that for later. <laughs> clank, clank, clank. All right, so Philomene Lopez uh, asked us, how hard is it to learn Gaelic or Gaelic? And uh, Joshua uh, Putman, then he had a question that was very similar. He said, he asked if learning Gaelic helps, actually does help to preserve culture, or is it nowadays thought of in Scotland and Scottish circles as silly, quote unquote? I could say 
maybe he means like, is it archaic? Is it pointless, like learning a dead language? Um, so I do have, I have some, I have some resources for an answer to the first part of the question, which I could just rattle off now if you want. Um, the, the wisdom I've gotten from people like my friend, uh, Jonathan and such, thank you guys, um, is that, uh, Gallic is not too hard to break into. Uh, Duolingo is actually, as cliche as it may sound, is your best place to start. Um, there are other apps that have, um, uh, Irish or Scots Gaelic as learning, uh, options, but Duolingo is kind of, uh, the place to start. It is easy to get into and it's there. Uh, if you want to go further with learning the language, then, uh, what I was recommended was that you check out, um, either the Gaelic College of Nova Scotia, uh, or an organization called, uh, Soldmore Austic which is uh, located on the Isle of Skye, they both offer online resources, online ways of learning the language. So the digital age is your friend with this. Um, there are clubs, there are Facebook groups, um, there's probably things like Discord groups too, uh, where you can get support from people who are also Gaelic speakers or Irish speakers, um, where you can really get into it. Um, but those were the recommendations that, uh, that he gave me was basically um, start with Duolingo and then consider checking out either the Gallic College of Nova Scotia or Solomon Austic, and we'll make sure we get the links out there one way or another. Um, so that's that's the answer is, uh, it's it's I, my understanding is it's a complex language, it's a beautiful language, and it's it, get, it takes some getting used to to get your head locked into the, um, the phonetics and how things are spelled, but once you're there, it's not necessarily difficult to keep rolling with it. So it's like that first dive into the pool is the hardest part. I would say this, any language um, that you're not using and not reinforcing your use of will be more difficult to internalize um, the older you get, you know, when you're a child, you soak up languages like a sponge. It's a psychological, a psychology thing. Um, you are hardwired to try to, you know, understand language. After a certain age, it becomes more difficult to internalize. You know, I, I took, you know, four years of German in high school and one or two years of college, and I can still putter through, but I don't speak German the way I did, you know, in, in my second year of college um, or when I went over to Germany for a while because you're immersed in it. If you're not immersed in it and you're not speaking it in the home or you're not speaking it in a group or you're not using it on a regular basis, it will dissipate. It won't go away necessarily, but it will definitely dissipate. Right. The second part of the question, is it important? Does it preserve the culture or is it just silly? Is it, is it dumb? Is it a dead language? And you're, you know, you're not going to use it anymore. It depends on who you ask. If you're asking someone who loves his, now I will say this, we are not Scottish period. So let's start there. So our opinions on this matter less than somebody in Scotland, but the, if you're talking to somebody who loves history, loves the culture and all the aspects and all the things that are the culture, and they just kind of geek out on that kind of stuff, their answer is going to be, yeah, it's absolutely imperative. You must keep it. You must push it forward. You must never forget. Da, 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 da. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, you're going to have people who, you know, are a, a banker or who work at you know, you know, Primark, or who work at a store in the UK, and they have zero use for Gallic language on a daily basis. They don't care, they've never used it, they never will, and they're gonna tell you, yeah, it's dumb. Why would I, why would I care about that? So you're gonna get, just like any country, you're gonna get, you're gonna run the gamut on does it matter or not? If it's not a language that is spoken by the majority or even minority, but a large minority of people, there will be a vast number of people who say, no, I have zero desire to learn it, to continue it. I don't care. I speak English. I'm fine. And then you'll have others who will say, no, it must be preserved. We must carry it forward. So it's a mixed bag. It depends on who you ask hundred percent. Yeah, no, I think, um, I obviously I'm biased in favor of preserving the language. I'm biased in favor of preserving any language. Um, I worry about macro culture sucking up small, uh, less dynamic population wise cultures. You know, like I, I, one of the charities I used to support uh, was one that went to um, supporting uh, language schools and culture schools on Native American reservations um, because they're especially in a, in a risky position of 
uh, traditions and language especially evaporating. So yes, um, I, th I think it depends on how you look at it. I think on a personal level, it kind of makes sense to just kind of take that as irrelevant. And that's a weird way to put it. But my point is, um, if you feel the drive to learn the language, learn the language. Um, starting with your personal enrichment is the place to start. And if you wind up being a pebble that causes ripple effects and it helps other people to realize this thing exists and maybe realize it's worth preserving and studying, then great. Um, if it doesn't, you still have the personal enrichment. You know, it's good for your brain, <laughs> physically uh, and emotionally and spiritually. I think it's important. So um, start where you are. Start with your personal motivation. Um, I do think, to your earlier point, there are definitely language-speaking clubs for all languages um, because people realize you need to have some level of immersion and have some level of interaction in order to retain the knowledge and the functionality. So um, you'll find them. You know, again, the digital age is working in our favor here. So if you decide to get into this, you will find like-minded people without too much trouble, I don't think, um, uh, who will be happy to speak with you in a Zoom chat in Gaelic or whatever language you're studying. Um, yeah, it's, uh, and they're generally a very friendly community. Both Jonathan and um, friend Aiden, uh, who both study, um, have said the people who are into this are, are just tend to be great people, you know? So um, it's a very positive thing. And it doesn't need to, it does not, I don't think you need to have like the entire population of, of Scotland learning Gaelic, as long as you have enough. Now, what that tipping point is where it's safely preserved, I don't know. That's more of an academic question. Yeah, no, I would say I, and I, w I would expand it beyond just the language thing to the broader thing. Any sure. niche you get into, you're going to find an embracing community. Generally, you generally find other like-minded people are just excited that someone else geeks out about the same stuff they geek out about. Um, you know, look at our Kilts and Culture group. Everyone there is super nice. As long as you're focusing on the thing you have in common, you all come together within that niche. And that's how the niche goes forward. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes, that's my, that's all. Here endeth the lesson. Um, yes, exactly. The, the motivational speech of Rocky for today. All right, Mr. <laughs> Mack. Do we have Mr. Mack? We I'm do. For, I it's a dog. All right. So we have two questions that got to go hand in hand here. We have Duncan asking us if we would consider doing a video series on Scottish holidays and how they celebrate. Something that rivals St. Patrick's Day and the hopes that we are feeling well. And then we have Tony asking how to celebrate Tartan Day in April. Will we do a video series on Scottish holidays and how do we celebrate Tartan Day? I was just going to say, I think um, I'll, I'll say watch this space because uh, rather than trying to take it as a lump, as, a, as a, a, an entire content stream, um, based on what our resources are, our attitude has been to try and pick out pieces of different holiday related things and do them when we're able. So, for instance, the most recent thing we did, you know, it's a while ago now, but we did a, a piece on... Um, we did the, the Stingy Jack story from Ireland. So we're trying to do cultural content and we try to key it into holidays where we can. So in the fullness of time, I think we will have uh, the ability to say, these videos are related to this holiday. These videos are related to that. Um, you know, we've done things for Burns Supper, you know, Burns Night, for instance. Um, in a sense, that's, a, that's an easy one because it's a very focused holiday. Um, there's so much culture and so many customs and traditions and history and stories related to all the big holidays um, that it would it will take time. But we're, we, we definitely want to keep chipping away at it. I just don't see us doing it as a dedicated series. Just like, in, you know, watch us throughout the course of the year. And as things get better, we'll be doing more and more bits and pieces, you know, for each of the each of the big holidays. I'll say this, I'll go in and curate the stuff we have done that's holiday focused and try to put it into one playlist so people can find it more easily. Because um, we've done, we did the Scottish Monsters, we've done Stingy Jack, we've done a Hogmanay piece, a couple of them, I think. Uh, we've done Burn Supper, we've done a couple of pieces for Burn Supper, um, and that has its own playlist. Um, so yeah, we'll work on it. We'll chip, 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 chip away at it. 
Exactly. Like a, so, like a tiny little woodpecker. Just exactly. So, yes. part two of the question. Tartan Day, what are, we, what are we doing? Let's do this. What are we doing this year? <clears throat> and what do we normally do? So, this year, um, drinking alone in my office. No, it's um, it, wearing, wearing tartan. There, there's not a whole lot. I'm not doing anything crazy this year. I don't have any firm plans for Tartan Day this year. Normally, for Tartan Day, when, you know, outside of the COVID times, um, the St. Andrew Society of Philadelphia usually has uh, one member of us, me, Eric, Lucas, whoever, down at the uh, Scottish Immigration Monument down in Philadelphia. We talk on Tartan Day stuff, all things Tartan and what Scotland means to the U.S. and to the world. I don't know. I don't have any real rituals. I, I have one, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, I live in a small town kind of ritual was that it's that I will tune in and watch the parade, you know, in New York and any other content that's being put out there from New York City. But that's because, you know, it's like I'm, I'm here at home, you know, in my little suburban house. I would like to go mobile someday. I'd like for us to actually, you know, do a road trip up to the city and actually, you know, take in the take in the whole big experience. But I think Tartan, Tartan Day is kind of like a call to arms right now. It's, there's there's not like huge Tartan Day events all over the country. There's more and more and more, and we need more of them. And so if you're involved in one, by all means, let us know and and uh, make sure that all your friends know. Um, but sometimes you, I think I take Tartan Day on more of a personal level. It's it's a day to really put on your best stuff and go out there and interface with the public and you know you know raise a glass in public for for the the, the Scots who came over here and made this country what it is. You know what I mean? It's uh. It, it, it's growing, but it does not have the gravitas that St. Patrick's Day has yet. You want to make an excuse for a party wherever you are, you know what I mean? Uh, and preferably doing something in public. You know, it's like Burns Night is is a, a homey, inward-looking, intimate, warm kind of a thing. And this is like a party. I think Tartan Day should be absolutely a in-your-face, you know, strut-your-stuff kind of a party. Kind so. of, Burns Night's still kind of a party. It's just yeah, but you know what I mean. It, yeah, it's it's because it's a winter holiday. Even just because of that in and of itself, I feel like it's more insular in a way. Yeah. It has rituals attached to it. Whereas uh, Tartan Day, I feel like it's you get all your kilted buddies together and at least get your kilted friends together, your Scottish heritage friends, and go out to a pub. You know, I don't want anybody putting on like plastic blue saltire necklaces. You know, or wearing Bobby Burns hats or something. But but. Uh, tartan top hat. Tartan top hat. Yes, Mac, okay. make me a tartan top hat. I'll be the leader of the Tartan Day top hat parade. Uh, no, no. Uh, I got anything of you like in a in a tartan mummer's costume, like strutting down a, you know, with a with a big with a big stick and everything. Uh, the, like the big mummer's feathers. Yeah, like a mummer's a mummer's outfit, but all made out of tartan. But no, I, that's but that's the long and short of it. Is basically, you know, you, you got to do it on a personal level right now but the more you can arrange things ahead of time to get together with your buddies go for it yeah so. it's ultimately it's all about community and it's all about yeah. uh, your, your love of a common thing whether that's scotland ireland tartan think patrick whatever it's all about just celebrating that thing on that day yes just get out there whatever you're doing whether even if it's just as simple as a facebook post saying happy tartan day everybody even if your friends have zero interest in kilts. It doesn't matter. It's about raising awareness. It's about just saying, this is fun. This is a thing. This is something I love. This is who I am. Boom. It's out there now. Mm -hmm. I, th I think you should buy all your friends kilts. Yes. You out there should all buy kilts. Right. <laughs> you would say kilts.com. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, whose question was that? Was that yours or was that, was that Max? Uh, that was Max. Okay, Mr. Eric, next question, okay. pretty please. And now I'm going to taste my Play-Doh. I was half Come expecting back. Mac to interrupt me, but uh, so I'll do a short one. Play-Doh again. Yeah, Play-Doh. Okay. Joe Groves asked us, what is the proper way to clean a vest and jacket? You know, PC or tweed, you know, the, the whole line. What do we recommend? Um, he says he, he assumes the answer is probably dry cleaning, but is there any nuance to it that we should uh, people should be aware of? Um, no. Um, I'd say this. 
a couple things. I'll give you the, like kind of the general care. Um, a, a few things. Number one, um, <clears throat> spot clean it. Don't necessarily, if it's just a little spot of, you know, you got a little, you know, sauce on your sleeve or gravy down the front of your jacket. Let it, you know, let it dry. You know, if it crusts up, try to just get it off there. Treat it as gently as possible. Um, once you're done wearing your jacket for the evening, maybe lay it out over the back of a chair inside out. Let it gas off. Let all the, mm -hmm. you know, uh, your, your body gases. Uh, it sounds weird saying it that way, but I'll say it anyway. <laughs> You know, your, your sweat, your moisture that you emanate as a human, right. um, let it gas off overnight. Let it just kind of relax. That'll be fine. If you were, you know, dancing a little bit and sweating a little bit in it, maybe spray it with some Febreze as soon as you get home to let it, you know, kind of air out that way. Hmm. Um, I know for a fact the, uh, uh, the, the higher industry in Scotland, they, between cleanings, of jackets they don't dry clean it every single time but between cleanings they will actually steam it they will steam the jackets to kill yep. all the bacteria kill all the germs so you don't have to dry clean a jacket every single time they you know they hire it out um because dry cleaning a jacket it's 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 a bit of a misnomer it's not actually dry it's liquid you're still you know submerging it you're submerging it in liquid it's still getting cleaned via liquid and it really you know knocks the stuffing out of a jacket over you know 20 30 different cleanings so in order to extend the life of a jacket most rental companies will actually just steam it and you know and heat yeah steam it between cleanings um but if you have to clean it if it's you know it's been a while it's standing up by itself um then yes Take it to a dry cleaner. Um, ask the dry cleaner what they are, if they are concerned about the buttons or not. Because again, you know, you might want to, you might lose a button um, during the dry cleaning process. Some jackets will have uh, slits on the lining on the inside where you can kind of work your way inside, and the buttons are held on with a ring and a washer, so you can actually take the buttons off before you get to the right. dry cleaner, so that they don't lose the buttons. Um, but yeah, that's my general advice for dry cleaning a jacket. Eric, anything to add? No, uh, as always shop around to see who is the best dry cleaner in your area, who gets the, who gets the props for doing a good job. Um, I don't know, is there any special care that you should take, uh, take for tweed versus Barathea cloth? I mean, even just for home care, I mean, it's pretty much the same, right? I don't know. I, as, as far as, as a dry cleaner, I yeah. don't know. I would uh, almost interview a dry cleaner. It, it depends on the price yeah. of the jacket. If it's an expensive jacket, if, it, if it's a jacket you bought from us, so it's not like a, a $50, $100 jacket. It's a nice, expensive kilt jacket, kilt vest, whatever. Um, I'd interview the dry cleaner, check out Google ratings, check out Yelp ratings, check out their Facebook page and their ratings, you know, look for other people's experiences with that particular dry cleaner. Um, I think that's a very good bit of advice you gave there, Eric. Um, but no, outside, I don't know if there's anything particular to Tweed versus Barathea versus something else. No, I can't think of anything different specifically. Mm -hmm. Can you? Yeah, I'm not really thinking of anything. Um, I'll just take it a tiny half step further and say, uh, make sure your jacket uh, and all those things are well protected at home between cleanings. Uh, get that cedar in that closet and take them out to air on a regular basis. Make sure they don't get musty in a closet or they have a moth issue. So. I'll go one step further because okay. actually I was, talking with the, uh, I was talking with some of the mods about hangers recently, jacket hangers. Um, if you have a suit jacket or a tweed jacket or vest or a kilt jacket, or whatever it is, any kind of expensive suit type jacket, um, make sure you are putting it on a hanger with wide shoulders at the bottom of the hanger. You actually have wide, you know, uh, what are they called? Kind of rounded. They're kind of just a rounded, sculpted. I don't know. Yeah, it's I know not what you like mean. a hanger or like a, a you know, think of a, a typical wire hanger that you get from dry cleaner. Those are not good to store things on for an extended period of time because it can kind of, you know, put a little fold or a little bit of, you know, discolor the, the, the cloth if it's 
hanging in your jacket for a year or two at a time. If it's a suit jacket, you should try to get a hanger with a wide end to the hangers. That right. way it keeps the form of the shoulders better in the jacket. So you don't get that weird crease right on the shoulder or if there's dust in your closet or something like that, or if there's light in there, you don't get that weird fading or the weird dust right on that seam of the jacket. It's, it yeah. keeps the shape much better. So right. that's the other bit of advice I would give you for jackets mm -hmm. and storage. Yep. There you go. Is that all? Indeed. All right, next. Who is the Kilt Ambassador of the Month? He's the jolly green giant. Well, he's not green. He's kind of flushed down. Uh, of, of the Kilts and Culture Facebook group online. Kirk, we tease him a lot about his height. He is six foot eight. He is a tall man, and he has been uh, very gracious to us over the years with, with, with uh, the fact that we tease him. Kirk got into his heritage actually relatively recently. He was raised by a family that is a mix of Scottish and Irish uh, background but it was never a major thing for his family. Uh, he says that his grandmother actually did a, a nice family tree, but for most of his life, that was as far as things went. You know, it's like the, he knew that some people were doing some genealogy. Um, however, around 2018, so relatively recently, um, he happened upon an ad for a, a Highland Games event uh, online, and he thought, hmm, okay, that could be fun to go, and I'm, I'm starting to get more interested in my background, so cool. And uh, he made the classic mistake of ordering a kilt so he could wear it to the event. And it's been downhill ever since. Basically, Kirk uh, got that kilt and he wore it for the first time out for a birthday uh, date to a pub. His, his story from this was that he was really nervous doing this for the first time. But as soon as he got out of the car at the restaurant, the first thing he heard was somebody you know, shouting out, man, that's an awesome kilt. And he knew from right then and there that things were gonna be good. Since then, Kirk has just gotten more and more involved in this to the point where he is now a mod for the Facebook group Kilt and Culture, which is very much appreciated because he's a very jovial, very calm, and very cheerful guy, which is not what you expect from a sergeant in the army necessarily, but that is his career. Kirk is an army guy. He's been in since 1998. He's done two tours of duty, one in Iraq and one in Afghanistan. And he's still, he's a career man, and he is now a staff sergeant, and he actually gets to wear his kilt to the office occasionally which I think is pretty darn cool. That's that's something that a lot of us would wish we could do. And a lot of us, you know, I, I'm, I was kind of surprised that somebody who's in the service is able to do that at all. Um, but that's that's super cool. And he's worked up to the point now where he wears a kilt at least two or three times a week. Any of you out there who wear a kilt more often than that, shout out to you. Some of us wear it on the weekends. Kirk's right in that zone of doing it as often as he can. The other side of the story, of course, is that he, he was concerned at first about his wife's support. His wife is a lovely lady named Lindsay. We've met her. And uh, she was apprehensive at first, but after he started getting all this positive reinforcement, she realized what an awesome thing it was. And now she has helped him pick out tartans and uh, has insisted that he go kilted whenever they go out. So Kirk is kind of like a classic success story uh, and a rapid success story of getting into kilting. Uh, he's a great guy. And he's a great ambassador. He believes in being an ambassador. Talks to people about kilts whenever he has a chance. The one story he told us, which is the the, uh, the only awkward time he's ever had where somebody's asked him about kilts was uh, in a men's room. Somebody insisted on asking him about his kilt through the door of a stall in the men's room. You got to be pretty chill to tolerate that in that circumstance. So I give him props for that. And I think his latest exploits are he's uh, picking up uh, Gallic and bagpipes. So this, this is, a, a like I said, a classic example of somebody who gets hit with the bug, dives in with both feet, and is just going and going and going. So, Kirk, thank you very much for everything you do and for putting up with us all this time. Slancha. Slancha. Yeah, I, I love Kirk Kinnaman. He is a wonderful human being and a wonderful man. We are lucky to count him as a friend. He's a really good guy. Yep. He's the classic success story where he just jumps in and it's just like, oh, this is fun. And then you get that positive feedback loop of, more and more people saying how awesome it looks. Your wife supports you in it, or your significant other, whatever. Um, and it's just, it's, it's just fun to get out there and do it. And you're different, and it's just everybody loves it, and it's good times. Um, yeah, it's and he's he's going from zero to sixty faster than most. Yeah. Um, he started. When, when did you say he started? Twenty eighteen was 2018. it? Twenty eighteen. Yep. Yeah. 
and he's just, you know, he's multiple kilts deep. He just ordered uh, two vests from us a couple days ago. Um, so the man is, he's he been was, hard. You know, we met, we met him because he, uh, mm. he submitted a video for our unboxing video. That's right. No, back he, today. yeah, no, Kurt, uh, he stacked the deck in his favor and he ended up winning the, uh, yeah, we had an unboxing video contest and he, he we, you know, basically it was, you know, you, you put up an unboxing video of something you got from us and, you know, uh, you know, we're going to pick one winner out of all the unboxing videos. And he was the only person to email me and say, Hey, if I do more than one video, can I enter more than one time? And I was like, sure, I guess I didn't even think about that. And he had gotten a kilt package. I forget which package he got, but he had like 10 different or 15 different items from us. And he did a video for every single item. And I was just like, if through that sheer volume, this dude that has was to nuts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it, it is also, it was, it was a lot fun to watch and his, his enthusiasm is contagious. He does training programs uh, or has in the past, at least. I'm not sure if he still does them actively, but part of his, part of his jobs in the army has been to do, to do uh, combat training stuff. So I can't, I, I gotta believe he's a good teacher. You know, I feel like I'm blowing smoke up his butt, but but I mean it. You know, he just seems like Kirk would be a fantastic mentor and somebody you definitely want at your back and, and teaching you. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, I joking. He's he is my you know brother from another mother kind of thing. Um, he and I are like way too similar in way too many ways, except height and follicleness. I was about to say, and maybe the hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Sorry, if I grow a better beard. I don't care. Uh, aside from that, you know, he's a great guy. Anyway, all right, Mr. Mac, why don't you regale us with this, the other questions you got coming in? <laughs> what do you mean, the ones of what tartan are we wearing? And what about that sporn that Rocky's got on? Exactly. Sure, awesome. Back to that. Yeah. Ooh, special. Uh, let's start with tartans. Mr. Mac, what do you have on today? What are you rocking back there in your little blanket fort? Yeah, my little blanket fort. Um, I have. The County Crest Longford on. Okay, okay. Mr. Eric, what are you wearing today? I'm doing the, the Philly Police and Fire. Uh, I decided to go red and blue today. So this is my this is one of my better uh, expressions of trying to color coordinate. So I got my club tie. It's actually a school tie, technically. And I got my, uh, these are vintage uh, uh, 1940s cufflinks. Red, red glass. And I just really like how they tone with this, my favorite bright color tartan so police Philly police and fire nice super fancy i think so uh, today i have on the uh you know with, with pat or you know, saint patrick's day coming up i have on the uh celtic nations tartan uh cool. this is one that i designed actually uh incorporated the the flags of the seven celtic nations jammed them all into a design <laughs> and uh yeah that's what i came up with it's it's one of my favorites it's i'm not a big fan of too many red based tartans but i wanted to design something a little outside of my comfort zone when i did it um so I came up with a what i think is a pretty nice design um a red based tartan so yeah there you uh -huh. go indeed all right now the other question we have is about the sporin i will stand up to showcase the sporin dun, 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 dun. Dun, dun, dun. um it's one that uh uh i've seen it in a, a few different places online and i uh Call up our spore maker and I said, "Hey, Mr. Greg, uh, kind of dig on that. What do, what do we got going on there?" So, uh, ordered one up, deciding whether I like it as is or if I want to change anything on it. If I want to, if I want to tweak it, you know, make it our own, customize it kind of thing, just for us, or if I want to leave it as is. It's one of his standard designs that he does, and he can do it in, in whatever tweed we want it done in. Mm -hmm. um, so it's yeah it's one that we are considering carrying so if if you love it if you have to have it you want to see it carried let us know in the comments if you think it looks horribly stupid um let me know that too and we won't carry it but i kind of dig on it it's i've gotten mixed reviews the uh really uh, okay. downstairs crew as it were lucas and people of that ilk are uh, less uh, impressed in the it. building in the building in the, the downstairs the sales guys right physically below me not you know, you know so downstairs um 
The men those, on the front line. Exactly. Yes, the front line people. Um, those people don't like it as much. They got they gave it a, a thumbs sideways to thumbs down ish. Um, but I kind of dig it. I I I don't know something about it. I I like the asymmetricalness. I like the broguing. Um, I dig the stag horn on it. I'm I'm not sure about the chain and the finial on top there, but overall I kind of dig it. It's something different. So yeah, Eric, what are your thoughts on it? I think it's hard to come up with a contemporary design that's different. Um, and I think Greg really did a good job with that executing that because it's yeah. um, it's contemporary looking, but it still has that old timey vibe to it because you're using natural materials. You know, the tweed is a very cool texture. The the antler is antler. You know, he's got the broguing. So all those things are like hundreds of years old, but he's managed to spin it in a contemporary way, which is pretty cool. Um, I like the finial on the antler. I think the chain's a little bit weak. I think, you know, as clumsy as I am, I'd probably want a little heftier chain, perhaps. Um, and I personally would wonder how it would be in like a brown or something to for, for day wear. You know, like a like a like a chocolate tweed or something, you know, kind of earthy. Brown tweed or brown leather? Probably a brown, like a like a like a, a brown tweed, and then keep the black so you get the two tone because you know I'm in favor of two tone, so you don't have to worry about color matching. Sure. I'd like I'd like something that you know would just tone with the antler, maybe. Okay, no, that's it's, my opinion. The I would say this: the I went with gray tweed because I knew it was going to be mine. It was you know. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, I get it. Um, the I knew it was going to be mine, so I wanted to be able to wear it with anything. Although I will say this, I do feel kind of dirty wearing this and not my regular sporn that I've worn for years. I feel like I'm cheating. <laughs> You're sporing. cheating on your sporn? Yes. Um, <laughs> Got the seven-year <laughs> sporn itch? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I don't think it's that long. Um, okay. <laughs> but the uh, yeah, it's I I dig the gray tweed specifically. The, I will say this, with the finial on it, because um, you brought it up, I don't think a wider chain would fit inside of the finial. Okay. So it may be if he drilled a hole in the center of the finial, you could put a wider chain on, but I think that's why he chose the skinnier chain because um, it fits inside of the, the finial is actually just like a cylinder that he's you know drilled in and then the chain goes inside the top of the finial. It's, it's an interesting thing. I think there's yeah. potentially room for improvement, but I dig it. I do dig it. Yeah, me too. Yeah, quite. All right, Mr. Eric. All right. Bring out the magic clipboard here. Since we're talking about fashion, I'm going to bring up a fashion icon for this next group of questions, actually. I'm going to, I'm going to group a couple together. Uh, Kenneth Sim and Brian Taylor... And Mark Essery, uh, Mark, Mark, I've only just met, but Brian and Kenneth are, are, are friends of ours on the Facebook group. Um, they're all fashion icons. No, we, yeah, sure. Of course they are. Um, <laughs> what they have in common is that they are, besides being enthusiasts, um, they are both fans of the Duke of Rothsay. You know who that is. Yep. So Good old Prince not... Charles. Yep. Yep. His Prince Royal Highness. Charles. Um, Charles. Charles is definitely a, a bit of a, an icon for Highland wear. Um, bless him for it. Um, and he is noted, as Kenneth put it, uh, for wearing a nice modern tweed kilt jacket uh, and vest. And uh, he's wondering if that's something that you can get or that we can offer, or is it something that is available? Similarly, Brian said he's a fan of um, His Royal Highness's uh, typical waistcoat and the cut of that and the design of that. But uh, these are these. it's basically he has a definite, very crisp, very timeless style. What do you think about it? Yes. Um, it, it, putting aside anything politics and I'm, you know, I don't want, you know, political you know, rants in the comments or nothing like that. Um, he's done it'll I won't say a lot for Highland wear, but a good amount for Highland wear. He is definitely a uh, a champion of made in Scotland companies. He's definitely a champion of Scottish mills. He's definitely a champion of the sport, our sport maker. Um, he Whiskey is, too. yes, yes, um, and he is a 
very, very well put together individual. You won't see him looking odd or sloppy or anything like that. You wouldn't expect to, but but he does a very good job, you know, with his outfits. Um, he does have a very timeless, regal, at the risk of sounding like I'm, you know, sucking up the royal, uh, a regal style and a very, a, a very nice, timeless style. The vest that I think you're referring to is like the flat bottom vest and his jackets are a simpler tweed jacket or you know, simpler style, not crazy embellishments and that kind of stuff. It's a nice, classic, simple, understated, but well put together style, 100%. I think understated is probably the key word. Um, his jackets tend to be very similar to a Saxon wear jacket in that it's a kind of a medium width, medium depth uh, lapel. Um, no embellishments at all, you know, so no cray no, uh, no gauntlet cuffs, no epaulets. Uh, it's a two button jacket, usually, as from what I've seen. Uh, the waistcoat um, is a shawl collar and then flat across the bottom. And that was actually the third part of the questions, um, which was from, because I have a horrible memory, Mark, uh, was what our opinion was on those kinds of stylings for waistcoats. But essentially, um, I've looked at a few different portraits portrait photos of His Royal Highness, and um, that's pretty much his go-to thing. Uh, you've seen it, you've seen a couple of different colors, different fabric choices, but it's that cut. Um, in some ways, it reminds me of suit stylings from the 1950s forward, um, but uh, it's, uh, it is effectively timeless and is definitely understated. And yeah, it, it's something that's doable, right? I mean, you don't have to be, you don't have to be royalty to, to wear a jacket like that, right? Yeah, no, it's I, the, 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 from the jacket and I'll, I'll extend it out to the sporins and the other things that he wears as well. Um, those are, uh, again, very, very timeless, classic, traditional. He, now I would say this, he would, and I'm going to, this is not meant to sound like a plug, but it's going to sound like a plug. I don't care. Um, the sporin that I have on, this is a contemporary, it's, it's different. It is a twist on a traditional sporn. Prince Charles, I could never see wearing something like this. I, it I would not be in his wardrobe. Now, the one that Eric has on, the this is a sporn you know, made by the same sporn manufacturer that is based on sporn that, uh, one of his sporns that Prince Charles wears. Um, we actually just put this up on the website today. So if you go to usakilts.com, you can check it out. I won't say it's a historical reproduction because it's not a straight up reproduction but it is inspired by the sporn that Prince Charles wears. His sporn is a brown leather, very, very simple. Um, it's a little bit less, uh, it's a little floppier because it's an older sporn, which is what this one is as well. Um, but it has that nice big brown targe up top and then little tiny leaves on the bottom. Um, it, it is a beautiful, timeless style. While the hunting sporn itself does not date back hundreds of years. It's only 50 years or so-ish that I could find when I was digging into it. Well, I guess 50 to 70 years. I was thinking 1950s. Um, it is a really, really nice sporin that looks like it could date back further. And it's, it's. I just love them. I love hunting sporins. Yeah, and I, you may have mentioned this before, but his, uh, I think one of the reasons people love that sporin, you know, this sporin, <laughs> is that it, it, it feels weathered. You get the impression he's had it all of his life. That's part of the romance of this, is that when you have a signature piece of a sporn or something like that, or a kilt pin or something, it's it's a part of you. And you do tend to hold on to it, and you do tend to love it. You know, it, it really is an old friend. And you really get that impression that, you know, for all the pomp and circumstance and stuff that he does, that this sporn, even though it looks like it's a little beat up, it's it's him. You know, it's, it's, it's legit. It is legit, and that's that's where people get the impression that he really does love this stuff for its own sake, um, not just because he's being told he has to put on a show, you know, or anything like that. So yeah, and it's it's just, I can tell you right now, just from wearing this, um, the design has been a tiny bit embellished from the original. It's actually slightly more complex in the leaves. Greg added a, a little extra a little extra panache to how the leaves are created. The targe is not as complex in terms of the number of studs, but it comes together perfectly. The leather is softer, it is very comfortable. I know that some people don't always like hunting sporns because of uh, um, you know, the, the closure system or other, but um, I love it. I've only just been wearing it today, but it is just, it, it feels right. I feel like I could go out and go deer stalking or something. Is yeah. this... 
I, I will Perfect. say this. It also, um, it kind of with, with a with a a, a beaten looking kind of sporing with something that is an older piece in your wardrobe that it's it's well loved and well worn, which is again back to the point about quality. Buying something that is going to last for a long time. Um, it speaks to the heritage. It speaks to handing it down to your son, to your kid, you know, to your grandkids, whatever. It speaks to the tradition. It speaks to the longevity of the style and of the heritage. So it all feeds into the whole thing of this is who we are. It's not just a, a throwaway piece of piece of clothing that's going to be out of fashion. This is something that will. You know, be here when we are gone. This is something that will last, that will perpetuate through time over, you know, hopefully hundreds and hundreds of years, but, you know, into the future, period. Um, it harkens backwards and forwards simultaneously. Yeah. To that, uh, and getting, getting basically to Mark's angle on the question, you know, Brian mentioned that he loves the waistcoat particularly, uh, and I happen to agree. Um, and Mark asked what our opinion was on the appointments on waistcoats. What do we like best? Like um, straight bottom or pointed, uh, notch collars, no collar, or, or epaulette or uh, lapels, single breast, double breast. Is there a right or wrong style? Is there a better way to go? Um, I think we're basically making a case now that His Royal Highness has, uh, um, he's got nailed down. But uh, it, if you are going to have a dream waistcoat, in tweed, what would you prefer? Um, it depends on different horses for different courses. It, I would say this, the vast majority of tweed vests that are in the market now are peaked bottoms. There's points on them. Flat bottom vests are a historical thing. It's kind of a timeless style, although the bottom points are fine as well. I'll do three. Bog standard, if I'm wearing a jacket and vest together, I would say probably pointed bottoms and probably no lapels. If I'm wearing yep. just the vest by itself and I'm not going to get a jacket in it, then I would probably do the same lapels that Eric has on there for some visual interest. I'd probably do the peaks on the bottom, the points on the bottom of the vest. I could take it or leave it with the, the flat bottom or the points in the bottom of the vest. For if I'm doing something that looks a little period-esque, shall we say, um, then I probably do flat bottom, probably do lapels, but the same lapels that Eric has on. The shawl collar um, goes in and out of style-ish, and I don't know, it's, I don't mind it, but it's a very, specific thing in my mind whereas the, the the peaked collar is a little bit more versatile as long as it's not like big 70s lapels um but you know a, exactly what eric has on it's a little bit easier to get away with different things with and i'm always for my outfits i'm always looking for versatility so i can wear it with multiple in, in multiple scenarios um double breasted and single breasted single-breasted all the way, period. Double-breasted is a very, very dated thing. It's it's in and out of fashion. It's out much more than it's in. So for my money, single-breasted, period. And it also, single-breasted looks better on you know average to slightly bigger guys. Double-breasted looks better on smaller guys and only smaller guys. Yeah. Yeah, you kind of stole my thunder. Um, that's basically, that's everything I was gonna say. Um, I would think that I, I I like the uh, I like the flat bottom vest better. Um, I think it just works better with a variety of sporins. Witness the fact that right now the points on this waistcoat um, are going behind the sporin. I think a flat bottom waistcoat makes that a lot easier. It's easier to to, to handle logistically, you know. Um, however, I think a flat bottom waistcoat will look very plain and very boxy and odd if it does not then have some sort of lapel, which is why His Royal Highness's stuff is the way it is. I like it a lot. I'm a big fan of shawl collars in general. I think that his waistcoat almost looks a little 1950s. And uh, when you're talking about double-breasted waistcoats, 
their high watermark fashion wise, I'm pretty sure was the 1950s. They were super popular back then. Um, but even then they never went completely mainstream. So uh, yeah, I think, I think uh, I like the notched lapels. Just again, without a jacket, it looks good. If I were gonna wear it with a jacket all the time, I might consider actually doing the shawl. You know, I, I think I might steal steal his style a little bit. You know, take take something from his look. Um, but yeah, I, I I personally prefer flat as opposed to point. But you know, I'm I'm also guilty of wearing vests casually and sometimes unbuttoned. And I will say that if you're gonna wear a vest unbuttoned, I think that the the points add a little more definition, shall we say. So I, I think if you're if you're always wearing it closed, go 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 flat perhaps. And if you're gonna wear it casually, run around looking like a rogue, then points look a little nicer. That's a fair point. Um, one other thing I'll point out as well, um, and I'm trying I'm not trying to embarrass you, Eric, but I'm gonna point it out anyway. I'm beyond the, embarrassment. <laughs> we 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 have no shame. Um, <laughs> the, uh, um, when you're wearing a vest with lapels, a tweed vest. What ends up happening is the back, the back, the inside of the actual oh, tie. The inside of the lapels is fabric as well, not the satin kind of lining. It's fabric as well. So it will grab your necktie and kind of walk it over to the side. Exactly. Exactly as Eric's has a little bit. Um, yeah. You, you know, so if you have on a tie with a vest with lapels, wear a tie tack or a tie bar and you know have it up a little bit higher right around this level the bottom of the v notch of the sweat or of the uh of the vest or waistcoat um so that it holds the tie in place because without that the material especially i've noticed around my tweed vests it will walk your tie over to the side a little bit throughout you know you moving around kind of thing yeah that's so it that's all i got i'm so embarrassed how dare you, sir? Get get off my stream. Get. I, I can't. I can't get up from my chair. <laughs> it's taped to a chair. I'm taped to I the chair. It. I can't get up. That was. I'll be off your stream in about twenty minutes, sir. Indeed, indeed. <clears throat> All right, Mister. That was you, okay. Mister Mac. What me. do we got next? Poo pooing on the double-breasted vest. You I don't mean, like. Don't, it. You like dude, it? I'm not Billy the Kid. I don't <laughs> lay on Bella Bella Breast Vest. Now he's got the bib front, right? The bib front shirt, yeah. Shirt. Yeah, that's totally different. That's a totally different thing. Whatever. <laughs> sort of like a Montrose doublet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Alrighty. So we have Sam asking, just wondering if there's a way to hide a slight tilt on my kilt. His hips are slightly uneven and it bothers him. And he feels like he's wearing it improperly. Um, is there a way? Are his hips tilted? Mac, are you? Is he tilted left, right? Or is he tilted front, back? He did not say. I will keep an eye out if he posts anything. I suspect okay. he's saying, I think he's probably saying left, right, possibly due to surgery or an injury or something like that. Yeah, my 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 uh, my father-in-law has that issue. So, let's assume left, right for for the sake of the argument. Okay. If you're either you have one leg longer than the other one, or your hips are a little bit off, or you have, due to injury, you're you're you tilt slightly to one side and not the other. How do you compensate? Um, the here's the issue. It, you, you're dealing with physics, um, or reality, I don't know, whatever. Um, if you have a patterned kilt, meaning a tartan kilt, a tartan kilt is, what is it, Eric? Gridular. Gridular. Side note, gridular is not a word. We looked this up today. Gridular is not in the dictionary, Webster's. However, it is a word that is used by more than just us. I am, I am in very good company. Urban Dictionary, as well as several others, do have Gridular listed to be a grid-like thing. Please, write your senators, write your congressmen. We want Gridular on the record. I want Gridular to be a thing. Period. That's my rant. That's my rant for today. Now, okay. 
your hips are off. You have one that's a little bit lower than the other one. What do you do? You have a kilt, tartan kilt. It is granular. There's not much you can do. If you, you know, wear it, pull it down on one side or up on the other side, you're going to end up being a little bit off. If you try to make the kilt to account for the difference in the making, what you're gonna end up with is a waistband and the top line of the kilt that goes down on an angle one direction. So a line that exists on this side will disappear on this side. So don't do that either. The What I would say is realistically split the difference. Pull it up a little bit on one side and leave it you know, down on the other side. So if you have a, let's say it's an inch difference from your right side to your left side, maybe Keep it up about an inch on the right side and down a half inch or a half inch on one side and a half inch on the other down on the other side. Maybe that would help a little bit. Um, I don't know if through physics and your body the kilt would kind of recenter itself as you walk around throughout the day. I fear that will probably be the case. Um, but it it is what it is. I, I go back to the same answer that I gave to the gent who you know had a prosthetic leg. Just own it. Just do what you do. Be who you are. It's, it's your body. You're not going to be able to change it. If you walk with a limp, if your hips are off a little bit, if you have some kind of you know, physical deformity, for lack of a better term, it's just part of who you are. Suck it up, own it, and wear it like a badge of honor. It's, it's part of your life. It's part of your story, your experience. If it were me, I would just do it. I would make sure that I'm put together and as neat as I could be in other parts of the outfit. But when it comes to the kilt, it's just part of life. It's part of who you are, period. Eric? <clears throat> um, yeah, basically, again, you stole my thunder. Uh, I was, I was going to say something to that effect. Basically, um, it's okay. It's absolutely okay. You are you, and there's not a competition with this stuff. Just, you know, it's okay. Accept who and what you are physically. It's all right. Um, and basically everything that Rocky said, the uh, or this way, everything Rocky said. But but I will get it. I did occur to me that if he wanted to dial in um, how things look for a formal occasion, one possibility would be uh, a hack, which I just thought of, which would be um use braces basically keep the kilt loose on the waistband and then suspend it with braces and that way you can tighten the braces on the one side and keep them looser on the other side so that essentially you are allowing the kilt to hang at whatever way you want it to hang all of this technology and all this hacking is going to be covered up by your vest and your jacket Converse, I suppose if it's casual occasion, you could wear a sweater, like an Aaron sweater over it, and that would hide it also. Um, but I think that basically the goal, uh, aesthetically, is to uh, have the bottom edge of the kilt look symmetrical, as symmetrical as possible, as even as possible, and then hide the rest. So um, maybe something like that, using braces to, to hang the kilt and tweak it, might work. Um, barring that, even if you have other layers on, that's going to distract from the the issue you're feeling anyway if you have uh, a vest on a sweater on a closed jacket um those things will help uh get a distract the eye um from the issue that you're concerned about i think the the only time it's going to be very obvious that you have a, a symmetry going on is if you're going around with a kilt um with just a shirt you know do you agree yeah the i i would i would go a step further i'll, I'll go into psychology you always do <clears throat> the um, you care about it so much more than anyone else. Like everybody has insecurities. Everyone's got something, whether it's acne, whether it's a shorter leg, whether it's a prosthetic leg, whether it's, you know, you're bald, whatever, you know, your, your belly, it doesn't matter. Everybody's got something. Everybody's concerned that people are looking at them a little bit weird because of that thing. And you probably felt the same way the first time you wore a kilt. Remember that? So ultimately, it doesn't matter. It's in your head. Yes, you can improve it. And if it makes you feel better, yes. Try to you know work in the little hints and tips and tricks that we're working out. But nobody is looking at you 
the same way you're looking at yourself. Nobody is comparing you. Nobody is judging you in the same way that you are judging yourself. So allow yourself to be who you are, flaws and all, and just do it. The sooner you stop caring about what other people think of how the, the minutia of your outfit, not whether you're you know, being disrespectful to the heritage or something like that, that's a whole different level. But the sooner you stop caring about the minutia of what someone else thinks that you can't help, the happier you're gonna be, period. I'm going to leave that right there. Mr. Eric, what do we got next? Uh, hang on. I need to have a drink. Next. Next on our show. Uh, this one's probably for me. Uh, Ronald Radloff. Radloff. As usual, please forgive my pronunciations. Or pronunciations. Uh, it says his daughter was doing research uh, uh, into their family, and it shows a Nordic line on both sides of what is predominantly a Scottish-Irish lineage. Um, he's wondering if you have any suggestions on how they can learn more about the Nordic aspect of their background. Um, he says they may have also been pirates at one point also. Um, so he says, thanks for any information and points in the right direction. So essentially, um, my answer to this is basically... Uh, your genealogy is, of course, the cornerstone of your research, and what you find out is going to be what you find out. Um, a number of the clans of Scotland, as we know, um, have a strong Nordic influence, or even were mythically founded by a Nordic ancestor. Always take the founding father story of clans with a grain of salt. Some of them are definitely documented, some of them are not. Uh, the Nordic factor goes back to the time period of what's referred to as um, Scandinavian Scotland. Uh, which was basically from roughly the end of the 8th century up through even as late as the 15th century, although by then the influence was really minor, where you had Norwegians who came in and settled the Orkneys and the Hebrides and some areas inland. Um, and they held on to this um, for a long period of time. And they were, they were in constant conflict with um, uh, like the Irish and uh, some of the, the, you know, the, the proto-Scottish kingdoms like Alba uh, during that time period. But... Uh, they were there. So my advice would be to look at general histories of uh, of England, not England, of Britain. Uh, look at the, as much as you want of the early histories of the British Isles if you want more of a sense of how that cultural influence happened. Um, Scotland, what we know of as Scotland now, is really kind of a melting pot of several different influences um, from, you know, Anglo-Saxon tribes and Picts and Gaels and the Norse, all of it. So yeah, a lot of us have some Nordic ancestry somewhere in the mix, some more than others. Um, especially if you're a clan from that region, like the McDonald's, you got a huge Nordic influence. So um, I don't have a solid single recommendation, except that you're going to want to look at history at the macro of what's usually referred to as the Dark Ages um, and uh, see what you can find out there. My my brain goes to uh, to 1985, 88. Take a look. It's in a book. It's reading Rainbow. The, yeah, uh, yeah, it's it, yeah. There, there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, so yeah, read up. It's it's interesting. If it's your family history, there will be none like it. So learn as right. much as you can about your individual ancestors, where they came from, and the areas where they came from. Then go research those areas. It all is regional as much as it is individual. So research individual areas and your own family history for a more complete picture. Yeah, the, um, the issue with Scottish history is that it gets very nebulous uh, once you get past, backwards, past like the, the 16th century, uh, 15th century. <clears throat> I did jot down a couple of recommendations. Um, two books that do cover the, the, the Norse influence in the area is um, check out the Irish Annals, which is an old, old, old record. And then uh, look at the sagas, particularly the uh, what's called the Orkneyinga saga, which is basically the saga of the rulers of the Orkneys. Um, if you want a sense of the culture and the history, how they wrote it down then, history, 
um, that's a good place to start. Uh, archaeology would be the other, you know, but you basically you're going to need to, the further back in time you go with this stuff, the more you have to kind of look at the macro and what was happening with the general cultural trends and then imagine how your ancestors fit into that. Um, but those are two recommendations. If you just want to go hit, you know, your local library, those two books right there deal with the topic specifically. Yeah. I'm glad I remembered I wrote them down. Mr. Mac, what do we got next? Alrighty, so we got one from Joe, and we've seen this uh, question pop up uh, at festivals and, and people ask us in store. But from one mill to another, given the exact same tartan, same weight, why would one mill's version be significantly smaller set than another one? Uh, he got a bunch of uh, samples in and was just curious on that. Sure. Um, the, the set size of any specific tartan is not it's not written down in it's not biblical law um, you don't have to worry about an exact specific thread count the proportion is what matters so when you're dealing with a thread count you want to make sure that all of the colors are there in proportion so if you have a hundred black 20 green you know 10 white and you want to scale it down if you want to cut it in half it's 50 black 10 green or you know 10 green five white whatever um it's as long as the proportion is there that's what matters so from one mil to the next you're worried about does the tartan does it have the the essence of the tartan is the is the are the proportions there are the colors there in order in sequence in proportion it's not a it must be exactly six white white stripes or six white threads in the center for that center stripe. It may be eight. Um, think of it this way. If you end up with a 11 ounce fabric versus 16, six white threads lined up are gonna be narrower on an 11 ounce tartan than it would on a 16 ounce tartan. So it, that mill may say, okay, well in 11 ounce, we want the set size to be about seven inches. Let's put it eight threads. Well, let's put it 10 threads, whatever it is. The mill, it kind of works backwards from what will make a good kilt, what will make a good garment, what will make a good whatever you're trying to make with the fabric, and make sure that the, the set size falls within that. Um, there are some instances where a set size is huge, Aberdeen, you know, it's it's one that I think La Karen's Aberdeen Tartan is like 14 inches or something for the repeat on the set. So you can't, you literally physically can't make that kilt to the actual set unless the plates are like three inches wide. Um, so it's it's a weird balance. Now it's but it's not it's not a biblical text where it must be taken literally, where. The, the, tartan, the tartan register says that it's 52 red threads, therefore it must be exactly 52. It's the overall aesthetic of it. It's the overall proportions. So if this mill wants to say, okay, let's, let's reduce the red by a tiny bit, but we're going to reduce all the other colors by the same amount, that's fine. Even I would even go so far as some mills would say, okay, well, this white stripe in the center ha is supposed to have black guards, meaning like a couple threads on either side of a stripe to kind of make it stand out. Some mills might say, okay, let's do two black threads on either side of the white to make it stand out. Another mill might say, well, that's, we'd like to see a little actual little bit of black there. Let's make it six black threads on either side of this white stripe, which is eight threads. So it's there, but it's still going to be called the same thing. It's, it's, close enough for government work. It's not, it does not have to be specifically an exact number of threads to be the tartan, so long as it looks like the tartan within reason. Does that make sense, Eric? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I was kind of wondering, I was kind of wondering how they settled on um, expressing it in terms of this number of threads or that number of threads for purposes of the registry like, did they assume a certain, did somebody assume a certain kind of thread 
a certain thickness of thread or an average thickness of thread back in the day when they came up with the system. Um, but yeah, it's all about it's all about the overall design. And if you consider it in terms of about proportion, then yeah, you scale it up and scale it down depending on what you're doing. Here is a good point. Let's go backwards. <clears throat> Before the tartan register existed, there was the Scottish, the, the STA and the World Tartan Register. Before those existed, there was the STS, the Scottish Tartan Society. Before those existed, there wasn't really anything. It was just what, how tartan evolved was a mill or multiple mills said, this is the McDonald tartan. This is the Stewart tartan. This is whatever. And they would say, okay, they would record their own things, their own, you know, thread count. And if Wilson's Bannockburn, which is an old mill, had a competitor and the competitor looked at, you know, somebody went to Wilson's Bannockburn competitor and said, hey, Wilson's Bannockburn is selling the this tartan. They're calling it Royal Stewart. It's a brand new tartan. No one's ever seen it before. It's Royal Stewart. And <clears throat> they're selling it for, you know, 17 shillings per meter. You know, what do you charge? And the mill B says, we'll charge 15 and we can match it. We'll do the exact same thing. Mill B may take the physical swatch of fabric or the physical piece of cloth and say, okay, this looks like about two threads. It may have been four. This looks like about 52, it may have been 56. And they'll just come up with something that's an approximation and then they will call it Royal Stewart, which will be technically slightly different than Wilson's Bannockburn. But when <clears throat> the tartan gets recorded, fast forward, you know, a couple hundred years, when the tartan ended up getting recorded into, you know, in for history, for posterity, they're picking an old sample of cloth and somebody sitting there physically counting one thread, two threads, three threads, four threads, and then they just record what it actually is. But the origins of it and what it was before that, or, you know, there may be multiple kilts out there in the universe of Royal Stewart from the 1850s that are different thread counts, slightly different. They both look about the same. There may be slightly different color variations, but it's still considered Royal Stewart. Now, when it was recorded, the original recording would be, okay, this is the best guess we have for an official. This is what it is going to be to look if you add this up this way and that way, warp and weft, it will look like Royal Stewart. This is what we're going to call it. But okay. going forward, you can tweak it a little bit one way or a little bit the other way, and it'll still be recognized as Royal Stewart. Does that make sense? So it kind of evolved yeah. through time, but it's been recorded so that there is a record of what makes Royal Stewart, whether it's eh, a little bit a little bit more red, a little bit less red, lit up by a couple threads, close enough. So they're going basically by either a, a what is considered to be a perfect definitive sample that they have or an aggregate of the best <laughs> samples that they have at their disposal. Yeah, people, they, they want to be, people want it to be an exact thing. And to think that this is the one and only thread count for this tartan. It's not done like that. It evolved over time through commercial enterprise, not through divine providence that, you know, the Lord God came down on the fourth day of August in 1802 and said, behold, I give upon to you this particular tartan. No, it didn't happen like that. It was an evolution and then a recording of what the evolution was and a best average or mean of that existing thing before then for posterity's sake. The Lord God of Tartan. Yes. Tartanus. Tartanus. God of Tartan. <clears throat> oh. uh. Anus. Maximus. No, no. No, it's not. Hey. Uh. So whose was that? Was that Max or was that yours? Um, That was Max. Okay. What do we got next, Eric? We'll do... One more yours, one more Max. Okay. Um, <clears throat> doo, 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 doo. Um, this is a this is a fun one. Uh, John Scott asked us uh, what our favorite Celtic foods are, and uh, then somebody else had followed up, uh, wondering if we might want to choose an Irish one, considering it is March. 
And we got uh, St. Paddy's sure. coming up. Paddy's, not Patties, by the way. Please remember that. P-A-Y, short for Padrig. 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 Yeah. Um, let's bring Mac in. Mr. Mac, we'll start with you. What is your favorite Irish food? Favorite Irish food or just favorite? Celtic. Celtic. Well, if I'm going favorite Celtic food, I'm going with fried chicken. Yep. Mm -hmm. He's right. He's right. Fried chicken is Scottish. Yep. That's where the origins come from. Yep. Very good to know. Mm -hmm. Eric, what's your what's your vote? Favorite Celtic food? <clears throat> uh, I don't really. I'm not as big on the Irish stuff. So, but my favorite all time favorite going back to when I was a kid, favorite Celtic food is uh, Cornish pasties, which is a, a, a tradition also shared by the Welsh. Man, nothing beats a uh, steaming hot Cornish pasty. It is so delicious. I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. my. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm giving a shout out to the wife. Um, my wife Kelly is a is a very good cook. Um, she made Cornish pasties for for us recently. She made like a batch of them and then froze a bunch, so it's been awesome. Um, <clears throat> they came out spectacular. The other one that she does that I absolutely love is Irish soda bread. It has to be moist enough that it's not crumbly apart. Irish soda bread is one of my favorite, especially when you rock. The carry butter. Um, That's the only it, butter we use at my house. Yeah. That's the only butter we ever buy is carry yeah. gold. Yeah. Yep. Carry gold butter. Um, that's a good one. Yeah, well, it, it is what it is. You, you pay for quality. The other one, one of the first things I came up with for what food do I like was shepherd's pie. I was quickly destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> my entire world shattered that shepherd's pie was originally English. It was not Irish. Blown away. Some of the best shepherd's pie I've had is in the Irish restaurant. Here's the story. In you know, Kelly's family is mostly Polish and they do a lot of cooking, a lot of baking and that kind of stuff. And you know, big parties of you know making all kinds of stuff together as a family. That's one of the, the beautiful things about heritage is you can have fun even if it's not your heritage. So they have they do glumkies, they do, you know, the, 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 whatever the hell the soup is that's like, what's the soup back? Muck's blood? Bo no, 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 boshed is what I'm thinking. Oh, oh okay, boshed. <laughs> no, not boshed. But they do big, like, pierogi making parties. So, me being the, you know, quasi Irish, quasi, you know, mostly German, but quasi Irish guy that I am and a lover of shepherd's pie, I had a stroke. Not sure if it was the regular stroke or a stroke of brilliance, but I had a stroke. <laughs> and said, a, a, a pierogi is just potatoes and dough with, you know, a little bit of cheese in there, a little bit, you know, uh, what's the what's the other stuff they put in it? Uh, capusta, cat supper, whatever they put it in there. <laughs> the um, I was like, yes, I call it cat supper, not capusta, cat supper. So okay. I need to improve the pierogi. So I made... On the fly, shepherd's pie rogies, <laughs> where I took ground beef, seasoned it a little bit, cooked that up, put it in with the pierogies, and you know I was like, I'm gonna do this. And they, you know, God love them, they let me bastardize the, the Polish tradition of pierogi making. Here's here's the sad part. I made a dozen or so shepherd's pie rogies, my invention. And I said, look, when we're making these, you know, they had, there's mountains of pierogies on the table. I was like, we need to separate those. And they said, no, 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 no. Don't worry about it. You can see the lumps in the outside of the thing. It's going to be fine. You'll be able to tell which ones are that. And they didn't separate it. And we cooked all the pierogies. And then they distributed, you know, for whatever the holiday was. You know, they kept some in bags and they distributed some for the meal. And everybody else got the shepherd's pierogies. <laughs> and they were good. Guess who didn't get any? Bum, bum, bum. Wah, wah, I, I am still wah. bitter that, that people tried my invention, my culinary delight, before I had a chance to. Mm -hmm. I'm still bitter about that. <laughs> That's rough, man. It's That's rough. It's the cross I bear. You know what will make you feel better? A nice Cornish pasty. 
You know what would make me feel better? Scotch. <laughs> play no scotch. <laughs> play no, no, no. Play no whiskey. Red breast. Exactly. All right. Who's was that? That was, that was uh, Eric's? That was mine. Yep. Mr. Mack, hit us with the last question. All right. Let's see. Which one do we want to the last question here? Bum, bum, bum. We actually had a decent discussion of this on the uh, thread, so I want to put it out to you guys. So we had two questions very similar down the same road here. We had Sharpshooter ask, I want a kilt that I could use to semi-camouflage myself in evergreens that is a non-clan tartan. What do we recommend? And then we had James ask about what our thoughts are on camo kilt in wool or in some other material <laughs> for out outdoorsy kilter. Uh. <laughs> I'll start by saying this. Thank God ghillie suit kilts aren't a thing. Um, hmm. The uh, <laughs> twigs in the branches and they, all the stuff. Right, 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 right. Um, the, what non-clan tartan would be a good hunting tartan? Eric. Safety orange? Loud McLeod? No, no, no. We gotta go with like it, like greens <laughs> and brown. I would okay. around here, I'm thinking safety orange. I know what the hires around my area are like. Um okay. no, okay. seriously. Uh, uh, <laughs> geez. I got my non, answer. I got my answer. Plan. Lucas has um, one on today that would work. What does Lucas have on? It's green. Has oh, a uh, red and yellow line. It's in the muted version. Spit it out. Yeah, I don't remember what he was wearing. I'm drawing a blank right now. <laughs> <laughs> you tease. <laughs> you bastard. I'm looking it up right now. I was going to say Black Watch yeah. Weather. Yeah. Something with browns and grays and that kind of thing. Right. Maple leaf would work for like a fall. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that'd, be, that'd be pretty. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. a lot of red though. See, it has to be like that that two week period. It where depends on the time frame. Fall. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anything weather would be better camouflage. Maybe a, a state tweet or something like that. Maybe a, a herringbone, like a subtle pattern. Yeah. It's it depends on the shade of brown, gray, whatever, whatever you're trying to camouflage with, but that's a, that's an odd one. So, what was the other question, Mac? The, um, what about our thoughts on, uh, like, loomed camo woven material, either in wool or whatever material for a kilt? Isn't camo printed? Uh, I think, like you said, a tweed. If you're gonna, if it's loomed, if it's woven, then you're gonna want some kind of a mishmash of very subtly different shades. You know, so I, I think I think you're probably on the right on the right track with a tweed. Yeah, okay. Or even a tweed you, tartan. You know, if you did something, yeah, tweed tartan would be fine. <clears throat> if you did, um, I'm thinking of my wife's knitting. She's had like yarns that are like rainbow yarns that transition okay. from one color to another color to another color. Right. Right. If you had, you know, really really thin yarns that were just brown, gray, green, you know, natural, dark, earthy kind of colors. And you mix them. I don't know. It, I don't even know if that would look good. They would just look like a dog's dinner when you crossed them over. There'd be no That's real. It's supposed to look good. It's supposed to not be, be no, there at all. Yeah, but <laughs> the, the, there's part of a, <clears throat> the, the, the camouflage, there's a psychology of camouflage, of being subtle enough but having enough of a pattern to blend in with nature not being so test pattern that it stands out or so clear that it stands out so no no, no love for digicamo what but even that marpat stuff like that even that has enough of lumps together that it works to the eye it's a psychological trick it exists for a reason <clears throat> i'm talking I'm, about I'm, something that's Effectively, just like blended puddle of yeah. blood. I got, I got what you're talking about. Yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go for a heritage angle, and I'm gonna suggest that Mac and I need um, Sheriff Muir sets in dazzle camo. 
that we can wear for Armistice Day. Oh, I think we need the uh, Sporn, you know, Sporn could actually be made ooh. in three dimensions, you know, ooh. but dazzle camo. It, here, here's my goal: urban camo. So, <laughs> not just the black, white, and gray one. I want the yellow. I'm hiding from pus camo. Right, but right. the yellow should be like a neon yellow or reflective. Oh, okay. we 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 need to. We should be shot. It's we shouldn't even bring these things that to, to. No, we didn't ask the question. It's not our fault. No, but we're we're we're, we're saying things. We're making we're things. We're just providing a service. Oh, this is in the ethos now. I don't want my name on this. Oh, this is horrible. I Here's the kilt. Home of the camo kilt. Yeah. Oh, the traditional no. camo kilt. <clears throat> All right. Next camo. Yeah. No. I, I hate to end the show on that, but I'm gonna have to end it on that. That's just whew, that's this is just awkward. It's we should we should just end it with an awkward silence. Awkward or awesome? Both. Awesomely awkward. <laughs> uh I'm just weather weather tartan great kilt. I say weather tartan great kilt and have done with it. You know? Yeah, that's fair. Um, Eric, what should we do for a question of the day? I don't have any on the top of my head. What is the how about what is the strangest place you've ever worn a traditional kilt? Have you ever actually gone hunting in a kilt? Have you ever gone to a rap battle in a kilt? You know, what's what's the what's the most unusual place you've ever gone in your kilt? That's a good question. Sort of on theme, it, right? I wanted um what's what's the uh uh, Mo, uh post Malone wore a kilt. It wasn't in a rap battle. I seen post Malone in a kilt. Right. Um <clears throat> I'd love to know if someone actually has rap battled in a kill. And if so, did they win? If not, you've you've sullied the kill. You, sh you 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 lose all kill privileges if you lose a rap battle in a kill. Mm. How the hell what uh, anyway. This is this is a random show. Well, we, talk, we, talked about, we, we talked about we talked about Prince Charles yeah. about fresh From Prince, Prince Charles fresh Prince to Charles. rap battles and kilts to mm -hmm. pus covered camo or pus colored camo it's it's all it's all here these these are the things we give you on this show because we love you all right until next time in our random adventures in tartan and kilts it's lunch of all guys lunch of all guys take care. I wanna know where to go, man. I wanna know. Give me the.